Welcome back everybody to the Building Lifelong Athletes podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Renneke. And today we're gonna to be talking about exercise and physical activity and how this is one of the most important things you can do for your overall health. If you're just joining us now, the previous podcast talked about my general philosophy to health and the importance of a health promoting diet. And today we're gonna to dive into one of my favorite topics, exercise. Once again, for this introductory type podcast, this is just gonna be an overview of my general philosophy about physical activity and exercise. And I won't dive too deep on specific things like programming or exercise selection or other things that I love to nerd out about. Instead, I'll try to give you a 20,000 foot overview on the general benefits of exercise, what the baseline minimum amount of physical activity we should shoot for is, how to find the right exercise program for you, and my general philosophy on exercise modification. So let's dive right in. All right, so let's start off with the question, why should I exercise? I'm assuming that if you're watching or listening to this, then you probably like to exercise, but let's pretend that you're coming from a completely neutral viewpoint. Okay, so now in the right frame of mind, I'll answer your question by saying that with very few exceptions, exercise can improve almost every single aspect of your life. And if it were medication you could take, it would be the world's most valuable and most commonly prescribed medication because of the incredible health benefits it can offer. Sound too good to be true? Well, this time it actually isn't, I promise. Whereas with diets, there's tons of unnecessary controversy on what diets are beneficial and which ones aren't, I would say you'd be hard pressed to find someone who says that exercise is bad. Like the only scenario I can imagine someone saying that exercise is bad is that they just don't like to do it, maybe had a bad experience with it, or know someone who had a bad experience with it. Of course, it doesn't come without some risk, it always does, but exercise probably has the greatest consensus when it comes to things that are beneficial for you. Now that I've talked about how exercise is pretty much the best thing in the world for you, let's talk a little bit more about what actually gets better when you exercise. There are thousands of articles that will tell you all the benefits of exercise, but a few big ones include helping you lose weight, maintain a healthy body composition, improve your blood cholesterol, blood pressure, and sugars, improve bone mineral density, your mood, and decrease all-cause mortality. That's right, the more you work out, the less likely you are to die. It's honestly that simple. There are very few black and white topics like this in the world of health, but exercise is one of them. That being said, I wouldn't be doing my doctorly duty if I didn't mention that there are indeed some people whom working out might not actually be a good idea. And typically those are specific cardiovascular diseases, but to be a real doctor, I need to say that if you haven't worked out in a really long time or have never worked out, it's probably a good idea to talk with your physician about starting an exercise program. That's something we can talk about later, probably a whole new podcast, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So we know that exercise is good for us, right? Right. So now the next step is to answer the question, how much should I be working out? The simple answer is to pretty much as much as you can. Once again, there are some nuances to this, but in general, the vast majority of Americans are not meeting the general physical activity guidelines. So the worry about working out too much applies to such a small fraction of a percent of people that it doesn't apply to the general public. The general recommendations by a few large health societies state that adults should get at least 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity per week. And, and you should also include at least two days of resistance training on top of that. Now that we have that incredibly confusing and largely not helpful definition out of the way, let's talk about what that really means. In general, to determine your physical activity level, we can do something called the talk test, which is where you try to talk while working out. For moderate activity, you should be able to talk, but you shouldn't be able to sing while you work out. So if you can talk, but you can't sing, that's generally a moderate physical activity. Things that will meet these recommendations include a brisk walk around three miles an hour, water aerobics, doubles tennis, even general gardening. So essentially, if you get your heart rate elevated even just a little bit, that's probably gonna count as moderate activity. On the other hand, we have vigorous physical activity. And if you're doing the talk test, you're not gonna be able to talk really at all here. You might be able to say a few words, and that's about it. Activities for this include running, swimming laps, jumping rope, or like vigorous hiking, things like that. It's also worth mentioning that you can estimate your activity level based on the percentage of your maximum heart rate. Let's take a step back for a second and talk about what maximum heart rate is. As we age, the maximum speed at which our heart can pump tends to go down. So when you are 60, your maximum heart rate will not be as fast as it was when you were 20. Because of this fact, we can estimate our maximum heart rate by taking our age and subtracting it from 220. So for example, if you were a 40 year old athlete, then your approximate maximum heart rate would be about 180, 220 minus 40. So now that we can figure out our own maximum heart rate, we can then use this number to find a percentage range where we should exercise at to meet our desired physical exertion level. Moderate physical activity will sit between 65 and about 75% of your max heart rate, and vigorous intensity will be about between 77 and 93. Some people like wearing heart rate monitors or smart watches or whatever, some people check it manually, but all those tools can be used to then track your heart rate and thus your exertion levels. So all that covers the aerobic recommendations, but we aren't done yet with the recommendations as we need to talk about resistance training. The general recommendation talk about at least two days per week of full body resistance training, and they're honestly super vague about what constitutes as resistance training. 
Activities like bodyweight exercises can count. So it can resistance bands, dumbbells, kettlebells, barbells, and really anything that provides some type of resistance. They recommend performing exercises that work all major muscle groups. And once again, that's very vague. However, what the governing bodies are clearly recommending is that you shouldn't skip leg day. In fact, you're doing your country a disservice if you skip leg day. How's that for a guilt trip? But seriously, don't do it. Don't skip your leg day. If after hearing all this, you're just feeling so overwhelmed and you're saying, Jordan, there's no way that I have time for that. Then I'll say, just start doing something. It is incredible how many benefits we can get from even just a little bit of exercise. So even if you have five minutes per day, start there. The overall recommendations I want you to take home is that I just want you to start exercising. And if you're already exercising, make sure you're hitting the minimum recommendations. And then if you're meeting those minimum recommendations, try to increase from there as much as you can because the benefits really just keep, do keep stacking up. I know it sounds demanding, but I just want to get my point across that exercise and movement are non-negotiables for me. And I'm truly so passionate about their benefits. So let's pretend that you've heard me ranting about how great physical activity is for you and you finally decided that you want to try an exercise. Or you already bought into the idea but don't know where to start and you have the question, how do I pick an exercise program? The overarching idea is that you should reverse engineer based off of the lifestyle you want to live. What I mean by this is that we should start with the end in mind and work back from there. For example, maybe you are a midlife weekend warrior who just wants to be healthy for their kids as you age. Or maybe you're a 20-something CrossFit athlete who's really hoping to make it to regionals next year. Those are two incredibly different athletes who will have two very different goals for their exercise routines. You really have to ask yourself what you want to get out of the exercise and start to build a routine around those goals. To do this, I think there are probably two main things to think about when selecting an exercise program, adherence and efficiency. Let's unpack this a little bit. Under the umbrella of adherence, we have to answer the most important question, which is whether or not this type of exercise fits with your lifestyle. This means we have to think about what specific exercises we perform, how many times per week we're doing it, are you enjoying it, or are you just tolerating it, and is there something that you can see yourself doing for a very long time? I actually think the most important ideas are that you need to find something that you can put up with or enjoy for the foreseeable future. For example, if we told our previously mentioned CrossFit athlete that we're going to have him do nothing but long, slow distance cardio, but probably no lifting, that's probably not going to end well. I'm sure our athlete would become frustrated because the workouts are incongruent with their goals and desires, and they'd either ignore our advice or eventually look for something else to do. That's why we have to start with the end in mind. On top of that, it's not just as easy as doing something you think is fun, but we also need to make it sustainable. There's no point in going pedal to the metal seven days a week, 365 days a year, because that's a fast track to burnout city, man. We have to take breaks and find a program that not only gets you the physical changes you want, but also make it something that you can do week in and week out. There are definitely times for more intense training, like if you're preparing for a competition or some other goal, but that should be considered and factored into the broader context of our training. Additionally, to talk about our second point, we need to make sure that this training is effective. Let's talk about our midlife athlete who just wants to be healthy as they age for a second. How do we know if their exercise routine is effective? Well, it all depends on their goals, but we can look at a few things like improvement in strength, maybe body composition, aerobic fitness, their overall satisfaction with their routine, things like that. If they want to stay healthy for life, then we need to program the right amount, not too much and not too little. And if we don't do that, then we're not going to have an effective routine and we won't accomplish the goals. Having the goal to quote unquote stay fit might seem vague, but if you're at the end of the day meeting these physical activity recommendations that we talked about, then you're probably going to be on a really good path. If from there you want to move and improve and do things to help yourself make yourself better, that's great. Go for it. Knock yourself out. A self-motivated athlete is much more likely to stick with something than someone just going through the motions. And now you may be thinking, Jordan, this seems fine, but how the heck do I figure out what to do? And I want to give you a few options. The first thing you can do, and the most ideal option is to get a coach. I can't explain to you how valuable a coach is, no matter like where you are in your athletic journey. If you've never lifted before, a coach can be invaluable to help you teach proper form, um, you know, can kind of help guide you and answer specific questions as you're getting started. Heck, having a coach isn't just for in inexperienced athletes though. It can be beneficial for anybody at any time in their journey. They can help refine your goals for you, program the specific exercises you should do, and adjust things in real time to help you achieve your goals. It really is hard to beat a coach because they can adjust things to, to how you work best, and it's beneficial to let someone else decide what you're going to do so you can just step back and just put the work in. Now, I can hear most of you saying, okay, Jordan, well, what do I do if I'm not Bill Gates and can't afford a coach? I'm glad you asked that question. For the next point, I'd like to direct you to the thing called the internet. Maybe you've heard of it. I don't know, but seriously, the internet can be a fantastic yet also terrible place to find information. So it's important to find solid vetted resources to guide you. It's perfectly acceptable to find a program from someone you trust online and start going from there. Hopefully they have some videos explaining some of the movements and then from there you can kind of slowly ramp up your program. 
This is currently where I'm at my journey. I pay for a subscription every month to have a program made for me and it's worth every penny right now. Could I program for myself? Yes. Do I want to do that? No, I do not. And also I feel comfortable enough to make adjustments for myself where I can make a generic template a bit more customized for me, but that is something that comes with time. I think most people will probably fall into this online program group and that's totally fine. If you have any questions about some solid resources for you to start following, let me know and I'll point you in the right direction. Our final option then would be to program for yourself. What that means is you are deciding what exercises you're going to do, how many sets, how many reps, how many times per week, and all that fun stuff. It can be a bit overwhelming, but some people like the challenge or simply they just don't want to do anything else. And they want to do the things they want to do. Hey man, you do you. Maybe you want to make some choices and you just want to hop on the gym, do the machines, and then do some cardio at the end of the day. You, you know what? That's going to work. That's totally fine. And as you'll hear time and time again, I just want you to work out and I truly don't care what you do. So as long as you're following the general principles of aerobic and resistance training, it's going to work. Okay. So now you want to work out and you've picked your program out, but right as you're about to get started, you realize that either one, you can't do the movements they're asking you to do, or two, you don't have the right equipment for the movement. What do you do? Well, that's a pretty good question, but the good news is pretty much every exercise is modifiable. But the bad news is that sometimes it can be a little tricky and you have to be a little creative to find a substitute. I have a home gym and sometimes I don't have all the equipment my workout asks for. And oftentimes I'll have to modify my movements to fit what I have available. However, I have pretty much two main principles that I follow when I modify an exercise that usually gets me to where I need to be. The first question I ask is, one, what is the basic movement that I'm replacing? And the second is, what is the intent behind the programming? For identifying what movement you're replacing, you can start dividing kind of into broad categories. Is this an upper or is this lower? And then you can kind of get down from there into more complex meaning. Is this a lunge? Is this a squat? Is this a push, pull, hinge, carry, core, aerobic work, anaerobic work, all these different things. So as you can see, it can get a little complicated, but don't let perfection get in the way of good enough. For the intent question, we'll need to look at the program and try to figure out what the program was trying to get at when they programmed that initial movement. Is the movement you're supposed to do three sets of three reps? Well then, it might be geared a little more towards strength improvement, whereas if the exercise is part of a circuit, it may be more of a conditioning piece. If this is all new to you, don't sweat it too much. If you can't do the exercise, you can try to Google search exercise name and replacement and see if something works. Or if you can't figure that out, you can always limit the weight or range of motion of the exercise if it's just a little easier for you. If it's a super complicated movement, like maybe some gymnastic work or an Olympic lift, you actually might need to get some help with that. But if it's more straightforward, you can kind of give it your best effort and either follow the program as you're able to, maybe make a modification, maybe you decrease the movement range of motion or the weight, or find a similar exercise and use that instead. There's lots of ways around it. I always want to err on the side of being too cautious though, because if you don't go quite as hard, that's okay. You'll live to lift another day. But if you go way too hard, way too fast, or way too much weight and hurt yourself, then it sets you back. Every workout is modifiable and our end goal is to get you moving and stay an athlete for life. To do this, we'll have to tweak some things as they come up and adapt as we grow as athletes. This is something I've started to incorporate over the past few years, and it's been really great for my workouts. I'll do probably an entire podcast on this at some point. It's really important to me, but I just wanted to let you know that it's okay to modify things if you need to. That being said, if you can follow a program, you should probably just do that because the way it was programmed was probably programmed for a reason, and it'll be helpful to let you know if you're responding to that program. But modification of exercises and activities is a core belief of mine. And as a sports doctor, my goal is to help you move better and stay out of trouble. So we can do that anytime we feel it's necessary. So there you have it, my overarching philosophy to physical activity. I hope this wasn't too overwhelming for you, but in case it was, here are some actual take-home points that I want you to remember. Number one, there is no dispute that exercise is good for you. This is a must if we want to stay healthy. Number two, some exercise is good, more is better. Aim to reach at least the national recommendation of 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise with at least two days of resistance training per week. Number three, pick a program that you are excited about and feel will be sustainable for you for the foreseeable future. If you need to get a coach or purchase an online program, do it. Having a plan is so worth it. And finally, number four, if you can't do a movement or don't have the right equipment, don't be afraid to try and modify your workout so that you can still feel accomplished and get the intended stimulus from the workout. So that is it for today. I hope you found this helpful. If you did find this helpful, it would mean the world to me if you either liked, shared, or subscribed to the channel. And if you think somebody may benefit from this material, please share it with them. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. Take care.